Okay, folks. I want to thank you all for being here today and welcome. Uh, I think you're in for quite a treat. Uh, we have with us today Mr. Joel Albright from Albright Jerseys LLC in uh, Willard, I believe it is, Ohio. He's a third generation Jersey breeder. Um, was it 1947 uh, the farm was established? So they have a, a long term uh, dairy operation that has expanded and up, updated or upgraded in uh, uh, facilities and, and along the way, and he's going to share a lot of that with you. Joel uh, taught school for 17 years and uh, worked with the FFA organization, uh, I think all of that time, uh, as an FFA sponsor. And uh, I think uh, his, his teaching skills should uh, help him today with this group. So um, I also wanted to share with you that Joel and his family were uh, recipients of the Young Jersey Breeder Award in 2016. And then he ran and was elected to our American Jersey Cattle Association Board of Directors this past June. So uh, Joel has been a leader, uh, obviously, uh, in, throughout his life. And uh, they have upgraded. Uh, they currently have a lot of exciting things going on on their farm. They have uh, it's an operating robot system. They milk a lot of jerseys and get a lot of milk out of them. And uh, we're looking forward to what he has to share with us today. Joel, welcome. Well, thank you, Neil. Um, real quick, I'd like to introduce my family. Uh, my wife, Mary Beth. Oh, that's a bad spot to stay. My wife, Mary Beth. Um, my two kids, Lauren and Luke. Uh, this is going to be a real challenge for them to behave in the front. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff from Jersey, uh, especially Kayla Talkin for making this video, um, putting up with us, um, they, and Kim Billman, they've done a fabulous job putting together the footage so that we can share our story. I would never get all that work done to, to share our story. Uh, so feel very uh, fortunate to be asked to do this um, and very thankful that there were people that were willing to come to our farm and help us tell our story. Uh, we were pretty hesitant about doing this kind of thing. Uh, we've always been pretty modest people and giving tours and things like this really hasn't been something we've done a lot of. And uh, so, it's a good experience though, so if you've never done it, I would encourage you to take the opportunity to do it, tell your story. I'm sure you're all doing a lot of good things. How many dairy farmers do we have in the group today? A bunch. That's awesome. You got off the farm for a day. Um, I want to congratulate every one of you. You're a survivor at this point. Um, the last five years have been pretty rough. Hopefully there's some light at the end of this tunnel. A uh, little better class three milk prices we're seeing for the future and, and hopefully some, some better days. Um, today, uh, I'd like to tell our story. Uh, I don't want to try to tell you that anything that we're doing is something different than anyone else. Uh, I'm going to share the good and the bad and, and what our experiences have been. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you're going to have, hopefully, to help me get through the end of this presentation. So with that, we'll get started. Hi. Uh, my name is Fred Albright, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the Albright Family Jersey Farm in Willard, Ohio. Uh, this farm is currently a partnership between my son and my wife and we milk approximately 600 cows here. Uh, the dairy operation was pretty much started by my father uh, right after World War II. Uh, in 1946, they made some major renovations here at the farm and uh, began to expand a Jersey herd that 
uh, actually started here in the 1930s. Uh, my grandfather milked some Jersey cows here. They put in a uh, double 24 or a, a 24 stall stanchion barn. I got to get my terminology right here. Uh, it, at that time, on a barn that they renovated and uh, added more cows to the herd. Uh, in the mid uh, 1950s, the herd had to be liquidated due to bangs. Uh, I remember my father telling me that uh, they only had seven cows left at that time and began to repopulate the herd. When uh, artificial insemination became popular though, my dad began uh, inseminating cows on his own. He pretty much figured out how to do it on his own and we've been breeding cows uh, artificially ever since then. So I want to tell you a little bit about our team. Uh, one of the things that we did when we put robots in was we scaled back our workforce significantly. We went from about 12 employees down to five, uh, which has created some unique new challenges. Um, the other thing you're going to see in this video today, um, you're going to see some members of our advisory group um, give some of the presentation too. And I wanted to introduce you to some of those people so that you understand why I felt strong about including those people. We started meeting as a group uh, in the early 2000s. And in, in the early 2000s, we were not a very good dairy farm. Uh, we, we had a rolling herd average of about 13,000 pounds of milk um, in 2004. And uh, in 2017, we got up to over 22,000 as actual. So those people in that group, as a group, we worked together, identified our biggest issues, uh, decided what we could do, what we could afford to do uh, to meet those challenges and improve our production and profitability. And uh, I feel very fortunate to have had those people uh, be part of our team. Uh, that group's evolved a little bit over time. Most of those people have been with us the whole time. Uh, but you're going to hear from a few of them in, in, in different parts of the video, and I wanted to explain why uh, those folks show up in our, our presentation. Uh, we've got three really nice heifer growers that help us out growing our calves, and uh, we have one partner that uh, we, we partner with to, uh, to get all of our feed produced for our farm operation. Dr. Phil Sprang from Wellington Veterinary Clinic. I've been the veterinarian here at Albright Jersey Farm for around 15 years. Seen a lot of progress and a lot of changes in this farm. As you can see, they have beautiful facilities, but you can also see where they started three generations ago. Uh, we did start in some older barns. We have grown and progressed, increasing our cow comfort and our technology to help produce more high quality milk and also help cow welfare and cow comfort. The biggest asset that we have here are the people of Albright Jersey Farm. Like any other dairy farm, they have challenges. We've identified the challenges and have taken care of them. We fixed them, made them work around, or built a new barn and dealt with it. Allowed for us to grow and prosper and be early adopters of technology. The good thing. Um, the next thing we'll show is our overall overview of our operation. Our uh, facilities here are your typical drive-through freestyle barns. We have predominantly six row barns here. We do have one four row barn and uh, everything is on sand bedding here. Uh, we do have a sand lane where we try to recycle a, as much sand as possible. Uh, we have a flush system on most of the barns and an alley scraper in one of the barns that uh, we, in a flush uh, flume, to flush the sand out into the sand lane. And, and we been doing that uh, for a number of years now and it has worked out pretty well for us and we pretty much are exclusively sand bedding except for some bedded pack pens that we have transition cows on and uh, uh, calving pens for cows to calve. As far as our heifers go, uh, we just we use uh, calf hutches. All the calves are in the hutches 
and then um, after they're weaned, they go into a small group housing and eventually into to larger groups. And uh, we raise all of our own replacements here. Um, we do have a couple of neighboring facilities that we utilize buildings on to raise those heifers. Um, all the breeding is done AI on the heifers, unless we happen to put some embryos in some heifers. And uh, they come back here as bred heifers from the satellite farms where we raise heifers. And uh, heifers are all calved here and uh, introduced into our milking facilities. As far as the crop operation goes, we raise most of all our own feed. Uh, we have 300 acres of tillable land that we crop, but we also have about 400 acres, that, uh, 300 of which belong to a neighbor that we work together on raising crops. And uh, that cropland is share cropped, and um, what isn't our share, we buy the rest of it from him. And we're able to raise all our corn except for a year like this year when we had difficulty getting things planted. But we try to raise all our corn and all our alfalfa hay, which is our primary forages. Uh, we do raise a fair amount of wheat for wheat lids that gets used a little bit for cow feed and for predominantly for heifer feed, however. So there's just a... One picture that I think is one of my favorites is a picture of my grandfather and my dad and I. Um, unfortunately, as a family, we didn't probably do a good enough job of getting lots of pictures of all of us together. Um, so that one was one that I shared with them. Um, we operate under an LLC here between uh, Joel and my wife as partners and myself. Uh, originally, of course, this farm was owned and operated by my father and his father before that. Uh, when I started working here full time with my dad in about 1985 and he passed away in 2006 and uh, essentially I just took over the operation from there. In recent times though we formed the LLC primarily to help transition the farm operation to Joel and give him uh, more security in his future uh, and we've been working on transferring ownership uh, as shares to him and his family, and uh, that'll continue to the point that he will pretty much have full ownership of it uh, sometime in the future. And uh, the LLC is set, set up, of course, so other partners can be brought in, other family members or whomever that is, uh, by the partnership. Uh, and uh, as Joel wants to add his children, if that happens, uh, he'll be able to do so. And. Uh, Hopefully the farm operation can continue uh, into the foreseeable future and have some structure to work with. So that transition piece was a really big deal for us. Um, I feel very fortunate that I have the parents that I do. Um, there's a lot of stories of family farms that don't go from generation to generation because uh, maybe their parents uh, get snagged up on how to, to handle everything and didn't maybe look at things the way uh, I was fortunate that mom and dad look at everything. Um, it was a big deal for, for them, for the farm to be able to continue and somebody to be farming. And uh, that was a, a major priority to them and, and that really came through in our transition plan. Most uh, the expansion, current expansion, uh, began uh, about the uh, year 2000. Although my dad built the first freestall barn and uh, milking parlor on this farm in 1975, and and we milked in uh, in that facility up until the time we put the robots in here a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, we started building some freestall barns because we were overcrowded and. And uh, we kept adding free stalls until we're, where we're at today. Uh, we've been pretty much exclusively, as far as I know, uh, only Jersey cows have ever been milked here, to my knowledge. Okay, so 
our growth has just kind of been continuous. Um, I'm going to point out a couple things on this Google Earth photo. Um, the original barns were right here. Uh, that was the original stanchion barn uh, that my grandfather milked cows in. Uh, when my dad and his siblings were growing up, that's where the cows got milked. Um, my dad went to college in the early 70s, and uh, during that stretch, uh, the first barn and milking parlor got built right here in the center of uh, where all the buildings are at. Um, and we milked cows in that barn all the way up until right before uh, we started up our robots. Um, along the way, um, in 2002, uh, we stretched our double four herringbone to a double eight parabone. Um, and then we built our first freestyle barn right here, which was a double four um, or a four, four row barn. And uh, we were so overcrowded when we moved into that barn, it was full. Um, we finally got another barn built in 2011. Uh, we were able to put some cabbing facilities into that, some cabbing pen special needs area in that barn. And um, you'll see when we show our production slides kind of how some of these different management decisions affected our production of our operation. Um, we were still probably plenty crowded at that time when we went into that one. It wasn't until 2014 when we built this barn uh, that we actually probably had the cows spread out as far as we should to really get the production that, uh, that we had in, as far as genetic potential out of our cows. And then when we did robots, we did an addition onto the end of this barn uh, to add uh, more free stalls, but also um, our robot rooms were a new construction in that barn. In the other barn, we have a couple robots about right there, and then you'll see our new milk house and uh, robot rooms are about in that spot in this one. Um, so in 2018, uh, we, we did bring the robots online. We, we started out with eight. Uh, they announced the A5s were coming out, and uh, so we grabbed up one of the last uh, A4s so that we'd have all of our robots be the same. Um, probably another big significant thing we did was in 2014, we put in a sand lane. Now, if you're further north, you have no idea what a sand lane is, probably because it's too cold for them. Um, if you get further south into Ohio, they're very common. Um, if you see this square in the middle of this pond, that's why we put a sand lane in. That's a block of sand that's about 10 feet high after we've taken a long reach excavator all the way around that pond. Um, so the sand lane's been a really big deal for us to be able to use lots and lots of sand to bed our cows and keep them comfortable but yet be able to get some sand uh, reclaimed so that every load we haul in doesn't go right into our manure storage. So to do all this, um, we have our family partners in our LLC, but we also have another important partner, and that's our lender. Hi, my name is Stacy Devora. I'm an account officer and the branch manager at Ag Credit in Norwalk, Ohio. And I have a 10-year relationship with Albright Jerseys um, myself. And that goes back to a relationship that primarily started with Fred and had also transitioned Joel in um, as he graduated from um, being an education uh, teacher to coming back to the farm full time, which happened in conjunction with our uh, robotic expansion here at Albright Jerseys. So what I wanted to convey was we are able to do that because of this family. And what I mean by that is um, the records they keep, uh, the communication they have with us, their level of knowledge of their operation, it's break evens. Um, I am able to sit down with Joel and work through uh, a projection for a lot of times, not even this year, 
for the coming year, but we are projecting out two and three years, and at one point, you know, even five years down the road. And so to have an operator who knows the ins and outs of his operation and his income and expense, like Joel does, um, isn't something that I normally get to deal with every day. So, um, you know, not to tell you it was easy, but what made it doable is um, the management and the information and the records that this family could bring to the table when they embarked on this project, you know, more than a year ago. One of the things that really, really impressed not only me as an account officer, but also our underwriting team and our whole credit department, our senior credit staff, who was involved in the process, was that Joel came to us and had already calculated what, you know, I'm going to call the sweet spot was. So he knew, based on his costs and um, the income and expense projections of this operation, uh, where his sweet spot was, okay? And that number wasn't out in infinity. That number was very realistic to, you know, what they already were milking here at, at the farm. So when you have a producer that can come to you and say, you know, Stacy, you know, I'm going to milk cows forever and I'm just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, to have a conversation with somebody that says, you know what, Stacy, I don't, I don't have to get bigger and bigger because here's the numbers I have crunched. You know, look at these with me. See if you, you think you're... Uh, would come up with the same uh, analysis and uh, you know I think we can do this with just right where we have at home and actually capture um, the most efficiency with what we have. So when we kind of actually dug into that um, and looked at you know cow numbers going up and maybe profitability peaks and goes flat or maybe even goes down, um, it really came to light that um, you know bigger sometimes isn't always better. Uh, that we are most profitable at, you know, this level, and we are happy with that. And so we embarked down that path using that number of cows, <coughs> which was really similar to what they were, we were already milking. Um, but what that also did is allow us to say, okay, this particular project then, you know, we don't need to do a bunch of demolition and new construction. We can look at what we have here, um, make some tweaks to that, and, and you know, do this project um, maybe a little more fiscally responsible, especially with knowing the cow numbers that we're going to deal with and, and that we think we are most profitable with. So, um, kind of transitioning then to what we're doing, one of the really nice surprises of when we did our project here and with the robots was the efficiencies that we were able to achieve on a reproductive side. And um, we really had to put in some good SOPs for our breeders so that we weren't choking down our, our production. Um, so we uh, these are kind of some strategies and things that we have for our herd. Um, we're, we've gone to an 80-day voluntary waiting period for our cows that are over 80 pounds of milk or first lactation. Um, cows that um, aren't over 80 pounds, um, we're, we're going to go ahead and try to breed some of those at 60 days of milk or more. Um, we're also managing our inventory. Um, we're hoping to be uh, kind of holding it a size for a little while, and um, we don't want to raise any more heifers than we have to. We want to raise the best heifers we can, put the best animals we can in those stalls. Um, and to do that, um, we're managing our, our breeding program and using sorted semen on our best cows, which is about 45% of our cows. Uh, we're breeding our heifers to sorted semen, and then we're utilizing beef semen um, on the next 45% of our herd. And we're trying to identify at the beginning of lactation about 10% of our cows that we can just designate as do not breeds right up front and not even try to breed them. Uh, just milk them out as long as we can. If we don't get them pregnant, they'll milk four or five hundred days and... Uh, when they get way out there, they're still producing really high component milk. And as long as they 
make a decent amount of milk where we feel they're still um, contributing to our operation. Um, so some of our goals that we're shooting for, um, 12.8 uh, for a calving interval, uh, around 80 days to first service, 105 days open. Um, to manage our inventory, we're really looking at pregnancies, um, of sorted pregnancies per month. This would be overall pregnancies on the cows and then in average days of milk. Um, we keep trying to get that a little bit lower also. Um, with the transponders and the collars, that's given us an opportunity to, to wait longer to breed. Um, you know, you get averages by the extremes. What we've really been able to do with the collars is tighten that range down. Uh, we're not having to, to breed cows way early uh, to average out the cows that are getting pregnant way late. Uh, we're just we're getting our average with a tighter range, um, and we feel that is really helping us. Uh, so, so what are we actually getting accomplished? Um, we're about a year and a half in with those collars, and uh, with those SOPs that we showed on the previous slide, right now, our, our days at first service is averaging 89. Uh, but we're still at a 12-7 calving interval, and that's because we're at about a 1-7 services per pregnancy, uh, about a 48% conception rate, and that's with sorted semen and beef semen. And then that's got us at about a 36 preg rate. Um, so if you ask us what we're doing well, I think this is probably the one thing that we're doing the best right now uh, on our operation. Um, so, I will say that our, our pregnancy rate probably jumped up about 8% when we started using the, the, the activity system that went with the robots. Our heifer strategies. Um, to me, raising heifers is the biggest, one of the biggest cash flow burdens that we have on our operation. Uh, so we're trying to be as efficient as possible. Uh, with our jerseys, we're trying to look at starting to breed at 12 months of age. If we get them big enough, we feel we can do that and not compromise too much production. Um, with them, to, to get them bred, we're going with two services, assorted semen. Uh, we really want heifer calves from our heifers. Um, if you're going to milk with robots, one thing I would say is you do not want to synchronize very many heifers at a time. And, uh, you, and if you're an AI company and you've got people doing arm service, synchronizing big groups of heifers for robot guys will be a good way to get a different color in there breeding the cows. But, um, so we try to avoid synchronizing just because of the logistical issues that it causes in the robots when you've got a big slug of fresh animals all at once. Uh, we, ideally, we'd take all of our pregnancies and smooth them out to be the exact same number every day if we could. Um, inventory management through marketing. I really want to target, so that 75% replacement rate, for every 100 milk cows, I don't want to have any more than 75 heifers. And if we're really good on our cow comfort and taking care of our cows and we get our call rate down low enough, that's a plenty. And for no more than it costs to buy heifers, we can go buy a few if we absolutely have to to fill in that little bit of a gap. Uh, but you start figuring out what it costs to raise heifers, and uh, one of the quickest ways you can help your cash flow is right here. Um, so we're trying to get to 22 and a half or lower on a age at first calving, so we got to start at 12 months if we're going to get that average. Um, 20 heifer pregnancies a month. That gives us more than a plenty of replacement heifers 
if everything goes right, we'll have a couple that we can peel off and sell. We can sell the bottom, we can sell the top if the genomic test high enough. Um, but that puts us in a spot where we can maintain our size. So let's hear from our nutritionist real quick. Good morning, my name's Lyle Ruprecht. I, I do the nutrition consulting with Albright's. I work for a local feed mill called Gerber Feed Service. I've done dairy nutrition consulting for over 20 years and I'm happy to work with Albright Jerseys here and helping to keep them in business. And uh, I'll talk more with this morning about what we're doing here. You know, I compare it a lot to feeding a, a tie stall herd. For those of you that remember tie stall herds, you know, we used to make a PMR rather than a TMR. This is a PMR for partial mixed ration. And all that's missing is some of the grain. Well, with your tie stall herds, you'd always top dress grain depending on production levels. And really, the robot herds is very similar to that. We're a lower amount of grain herd. Um, we aim for eight, eight and a half pounds of grain on average uh, going through the robot. And it varies on forages how much we th put through the, the PMR, uh, but it's probably twice that amount of grain. Um, but if you, if you combine the two together, it looks like one of my TMRs, but uh, in the computer you set up a whole, a whole chart, and based on the milk production levels and where they are in lactation and what lactation they are, um, the computer allocates a certain amount of grain that they are allowed to have. You know, since we're feeding eight to nine pounds of grain, on average, you know, a, a, a normal diet of mine, if you use forage NDF as a hallmark of your forage to concentrate ratio, I might say we run from 21 to 23 percent forage NDF. The grain that's going through the robot, if you take that out of the equation, you might be running a, a 24 to 27 percent forage NDF. But then if you add in, in that grain, you're back down to that 21 to 23 range. And that generally has been our range where we can get milk, but we can still keep cows healthy and, uh, and life is good. Okay, so um, Kim and Kayla put this chart together for us. Um, it shows kind of where our production has been. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up to point out a, a few management decisions that we've made on our timeline um, and things that I feel like have been the significant things we did. Um, in 2009, uh, we just decided we weren't getting our cows bred well enough. And we made the decision, it was a simple one, but we made the decision to to hire an arm arm service from one of the one of the studs, and we got our days in milk down where they needed to be, and we saw an immediate response in production from our herd, um, and to me that one was a pretty significant uh, improvement uh, in 2010 and 11. Um, in 11, you see a drop kind of for a couple years there. Uh, we did some more construction. Um, the other thing we did was we went to three times a day milking, and these are MEs, so you see a bit of a drop just because um, when you go to, from two to three times a day, you, you'll have a drop there and that. Um, I think every year in that stretch, we increased the amount of milk we were shipping, uh, which was probably a bigger number to me personally. Um, you see in 2014, we really get, finally got the cows spread out. We got our stocking density to where we were probably 110 to 115 percent, down from 140 to 150, and we really saw a big jump there in production as well. Um, I think you also see the effect of genomics starting to shine through there. Um, we had used a, a lot of genomic young sire bulls, and we really were starting to see uh, some increases in our genetic potential during that stretch of time. 
Um, we kind of peaked out in about 2017. Uh, we were actually probably milking more before robots than we are now. Um, and one of the things that happened dur to us during construction that we didn't really see coming was our reproduction really sagged during construction. We just had a lot of cows that wanted to stand and watch what was going on all day long. Um, so when you do a retrofit, that's probably something nobody ever shared with us, but it happened. Um, you know, you're going to have cows stand there watching people weld all day and cut concrete and all those things. And to me, that um, is a part of that. Um, our, our reproduction has come right around. I mean, just within two months after all the work got done, the numbers went right back to where they were before. And, and then they got really good when we got going on the collars. Um, but we still haven't completely smoothed all the cows out. We've still got a, a seasonal, now we're in a spot where we kind of go down in, in number of cows milking in the fall and then we really ramp up in the winter. Um, so it'll be really interesting, I think, in this next year to see where our production goes. Um, but those are some of the, you know, ups and downs we've had, and I think there's specific things that are basic things that we did, um, and we can see some results from that. This slide just shows kind of where we're at uh, from a genetic standpoint. Um, we'll usually be in the top 50 of the reap herds for, for herd average. Uh, JPI, um, every time a proof run comes out, all those things probably shift around a little bit, but um, we try to have as many uh, heifers with genetic potential to, to really produce a lot of high component milk as we can. So why jerseys work best? Well. To be honest with you, I've never known anything different. I feel really fortunate about that. Um, but I think in the, the milk economy that we're in now, uh, there's a lot of advantages that the Jersey cow has. Um, I did some back calculating. I have that milk pay app on my phone. And I looked at the National All Jersey newsletter that comes out. And back at the beginning of the year, when milk was $15 a hundredweight, butter fat was still $249. Okay? So when you plug that in, even though we had a low milk price, our components still had a lot of value. And uh, so our basis on our milk at that time was probably 20 to 22% of our, our, our pay price. Uh, so to me, that's a, a scenario where these high components have a lot of value. Um, and focusing in the future, um, we're not going to get as hung up on pounds of milk per cow as we are probably pounds of components that we're shipping uh, because that's what's going to have the most value for us in the future in the, in the dairy industry. Um, other things, I, I think the reproduction uh, that we're seeing on our cows is, is really good. Um, and they're more feed efficient. I don't want to have to farm any more land than I am right now. And if, if we were milking uh, other cows that were eating 20% more feed, uh, we'd have to have a lot bigger land base. Um, we've been able to do some internal expansion. Uh, internal growth is expensive uh, because you're carrying lots of heifer inventory. Um, but we've been able to do that by keeping our call rate low, having good health rate traits and, and things of that such with our, with our cows. So these, uh, these facts, they, these aren't mine. These came from uh, 
a Capper's Katy study that um, was published in the Jersey Journal. Um, and these are just a couple of the quick bullet points. If you want to get all that information that's available over at the U.S. Jersey uh, booth um, in the Coliseum. Um, but total feed consumption, we're 30% uh, we're less. And this is for production of cheddar cheese. Um, a lot less water, um, just from the milk being more concentrated with components. And, and in the world of being green, um, we got a smaller carbon footprint, and that's probably something that shouldn't be overlooked either. So I'm going to open it up for, for you folks in the audience that ask questions. I do have a couple slides at the end that have a summary of uh, my commonly or frequently asked questions, and uh, that way if I ramble too much answering yours, I can re get back on track and summarize it at the end. But are there any questions? Yes, sir. What's the average age of your cows in the herd? Average age of our cows in the herd? Um, we've been growing a lot lately, so um, we were at about 37 months. Um, this past um, test day on our DHI sheet. But yeah, so we're, our average is just slightly into the second lactation. Um, we had, um, we grew from about 500 cows up to 600 really fast um, in the year previous to kind of leveling out at that 600 cow number. So we're gonna get a lot older and uh, you know, getting that percentage of first lactation cows down will really help us have more milk production too. So. Yes, Luke. Well, we went over that, buddy. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Uh, we do um, have a pretty intensive water treatment system at our farm. That was from the Capper Katy study. That's not our specific water on our farm. Um, we, we, we do test our water, though, um, and treat it. Okay. Yes, sir. OK. Um, we've been selling our calves for basically $100 over the Holstein bull calf price. Yes. Yeah. Most of them we've sold off the farm so far. What's the most daughters you have of a single bull? Most daughters of a single bull. Um, so um, currently uh, there's a bull called Kalmart Metalist Pilgrim. For whatever reason, he was a really nice outcross to a lot of the, uh, the violet breeding that we had used prior to that, and he just made it really great on our cows. So we ended up with a whole bunch of them, and that was the stud that was breeding our cows, and we got to use a certain amount of their semen. So that's kind of how that happened. Still him? No. <laughs> he still has pretty decent numbers, though. But. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll go through a couple of mine. Um, we got one more message from our lender. <laughs> so for all of you who are watching this video and thinking, you know, could I be a robotic milker in the future? Um, my words of advice are, first and foremost, you have to um, marry yourself with somebody who understands your operation, who is committed to um, not just seeing a project get underway, but seeing a project finish, and then um, provide the efficiencies to your operation that you're looking for. Because this isn't a short-term commitment, it's not a short-term investment, and so your lending relationship cannot be short-term either. So those would be my recommendations um, to start with. 
Um, but the other thing I would tell you is records, records, records. It all comes down to do you know the ins and outs of your operation? Do you know what your break evens are? Do you know that the project you're bringing to the table, um, you know, will will better the operation, will change the cash flow, or save an expense, or maybe it increases expenses, but it um, brings something else to the table that's going to change income to offset that. So there's a lot of variables, um, but I think first and foremost it boils down to you knowing exactly what your break even and your costs are, and then also taking that to the table and finding a lender who day in and day out um, is invested in your operation and wants to you know, see the success of the operation and is really looking to only line for future generations. Okay, so I put three slides, uh, common questions I get um, when we do tours or something. Um, just to kind of even summarize what everything you saw today. Uh, so what would be your recommendations to producers considering robots? Well, first get mentally prepared. Um, it'll be mentally draining. Any construction project is going to challenge you mentally. Um, and don't be afraid to figure out how to give yourself a few little breaks from that once in a while uh, because you need that. Um, if you're going to do robots, I think you really need to get uh, mentally prepared for the cost aspects of it. Ask what it's going to cost to fix the things that are going to fail a lot on your system so that you're not in shock when you have to pay to fix those things. Um, it'll make those conversations with uh, your equipment companies a lot easier if you understand and you're really aware of how that's going to go ahead of time. Um, find out how much and how frequent service uh, from your dealer will be required. There, that part's going to vary, um, but depending on your skill set and how far away they are or how many robots you have, that's going to maybe affect things. Um, but you need to get a really good firm number on that the best you can. I think those numbers are getting better. Um, and you need to know that so that you can budget for your operation. Robots are a huge commitment. Tour, tour, tour. Go see ones that have facilities like you have. Go see some that don't have facilities like you have so that you understand why in some of these magazines that they're writing about the must-haves that are this and that and other things uh, for a facility. Um, and the last one, go see operations that are the good and the bad. Find out, I mean, just in the Jersey breed, I can think of some really prominent Jersey breeders that have had really extreme success with robots and others that haven't. Go find out what made the one successful and what were the things that the others struggled with. And be realistic about yourself. Are you the type of person that has the characteristics of the people that were highly successful? Or was your management set maybe suited better for something else? And, and find the system that fits you. And make sure that if it's a huge commitment. So make sure that you feel like you're a fit for robots too. Um, I have to move this way. What are the biggest challenges of a robotic dairy? The biggest challenge is these girls never leave their pen. So you need to plan for how you're going to move cows. When it's time to dry cows, how are you going to get them from a milking pen to a dry cow pen? How are you going to deal with your fresh cows? If you're going to run a lot of cows through a robot and you're milking a lot of cows, you're going to have to have a robot that's pretty understocked to, to make that happen. Or maybe you need to have another way to get those cows milked. You need to decide what's going to be your best fit there. Uh, how are you going to get cows treated? Where are you going to treat them? You know, if 
You probably shouldn't have treated a whole lot of cows in your milking parlor, but if you are used to doing that a little bit, you're not going to be able to do that anymore, and you're going to have to have a way to, to do that. Foot baths. Uh, there's a real good article in the last Progressive Dairy uh, that hit a whole bunch of these points, but one of the things that really stuck with me was that we struggle with since uh, we put robots in is our foot health. And it's because foot baths, you've got to have a really good plan for those and uh, come up with ways to make sure those things still happen, uh, even though um, you don't have a nice lane coming out of a parlor to run them through anymore. Um, hoof trims are a challenge. That's part of how you're going to move cows. Um, cow comfort. How are you going to get all your stalls groomed and bedded and maintain the same quality of cow comfort that you had when you had the luxury of those cows not being in the pen and not having to worry about running into them with a skid loader and all those things. Those will be your challenges. What are the must-haves of a robot design? This is my last slide and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, manure handling. And there's a few weeks in the winter where it is just too cold for our alley scrapers and our flush to work. And I quickly realized that first winter why I was so thankful we could flush our alleys and we had an alley scraper for the rest of our barns. Um, you probably really need a fresh cow area um, so that you can take really good care of those cows and and with that, maybe some sorting gates. Um, the more we get into it, the more I see the value in being able to sort cows, um, not being out in big groups of cows and, and having those cows move to spots where you can do all of your work would be really nice. Uh, we didn't get a ton of that because we did a retrofit. And then you need to have provisions for your foot baths and you need to have some commitment pens. I've talked to a few guys uh, that don't have commitment pens, and I really just can't imagine how they, they get it all done. Um, so, But those would be the, the frequent things that I get asked. Um, so with that, I'll entertain any more questions. Go ahead. Okay, so we have one pen of cows with three robots in it. That's our two-year-old group. Theory being, if we milk 600 cows, about a third of them would be two-year-olds. We have a fresh cow group with two robots. Those robots in that pen, we have some sorting ability. And then we have, um, in our other six-row barn, just two pens of cows on each side of the feed alley with two robots in each pen. Um, so... That's, so we got a three, a two, and a two, and a two to get to nine. So, you're actually moving cows and so what happens is we try to put all of our cows through the pen with the, that we call our fresh group, and then they get moved one time. Um, so then they go to either a two-year-old cow group or a matured cow group. Uh, we balance that fresh cow group out because it's got two robots in it uh, with some older, slower cows that, you know, need uh, a little bit of extra space and things like that, too. Uh, 21 to 30. Depends how many cows have been calving. If we're really calving a big slug in, we've got to move them through a little quicker. But, yes? Five employees plus uh, myself and my dad. Okay. And so they're, they're, they're all five employees? Yes. And are they dedicated? Um, no, I don't mean, I mean dedicated to each particular... So, so we have one person that primarily always feeds calves. And then pretty much my dad always mixes feed. 
Um, and then the rest of us all work in the barn at some part of the routine to get all the cow stuff taken care of. And then there's non in the barn stuff too. But. So, so we had about 12 full-time employees prior, so we have seven less now than we did. And, and are you less busy now? Or? No. <laughs> no. Um, I personally work harder now than I ever did, okay? Um, I think that's partly a function of how we're configured. Um, we almost went back to being an awkward size at 600 cows. Um, when we were milking in a parlor at 600 cows, we, were, we had enough labor that we had more flexibility and things like that, but we've kind of come back to an awkward size. So um, we basically feed the same PMR to all the groups of cows. Um, we put one batch down in each barn, and then in the evenings we take and put a batch down and we spread it out where it needs to go between the two barns. So we've always kind of liked to, especially in the summer, be able to put feed in uh, more frequently. Okay, so we have two feed lines, so we have the ability to feed two different feed types. And uh, we have a primary pellet and a top dress pellet. And uh, the primary pellet's mainly just a commodity pellet. There's no uh, rock or minerals or anything like that in it. It's uh, just commodities, ground corn, all the different things that make a good pellet and protein sources and things like that. Yes. You would think so, but it's actually the other way around for us. Okay. Um, the two-year-olds, and, and that's because it's tougher to train the two-year-olds. So you've got a lag at the beginning of them getting with the program. Whereas your mature cows, if they've already been in the robots for a lactation, they come back, and Jersey cows love those pellets. So after, you know, they, there's times when you'll have a fresh cow that'll shove other cows out of the way to get into that robot, even for her first milking. So um, those mature cows will really go. Uh, the biggest thing is, like, at the beginning of lactation, those cows can go more frequently, and you, you really get a lot of refusals for a little while while they learn that there's an interval that they can get milk at. So one of the things that happens is you, you set a milk access table and uh, kind of the standard recommendation is pretty close to being about a third of your bulk tank average. Um, so then that's kind of a moving number. Uh, when we get into the summer or if we'd have a hiccup and feed or something like that and the bulk tank average would come down, we need to move that milk access down so that we can kind of keep those visits pretty constant. Um, but we've kind of um, run in that 2829 range. I mean, over the past year, that's kind of about where we're at. How many cows you got in the um, We've vacillated up and down there, too. Um, we've been as high as 70. Uh, right now, we're probably in the low 60s. Um, I think depending on how you're going to group your cows is going to affect that too. Well, or if you're going to have fresh cows in there too, because uh, you can't overcrowd and expect your fresh cows to thrive. <laughs>